All right, so we are stuck with a crummy snow day, although out here at the lake, what we have is rain. So I thought I would walk through the essays briefly for you here on UTC Learn instead of going through them in class, which kind of stinks because I'm sure you have great things to say about them. And it would have been a much more interesting conversation than it is a presentation. The first essay I want us to look at is Somebody Else's Genocide by Sherman Alexie. And I think a couple of things about this essay are particularly worth noting. I'd like us to consider the way in which the essay follows a form in the narrative arc where we have a twist in the middle. So we start out with Alexi in reading in Georgia uh, and a German woman who attends the lecture who comes up and says to him, you know, I think it's because Germans cannot believe what the United States did to Indians. It was genocide and the shock that we all get from that. That's surprising to all of us, obviously. And then he moves on and then he's in Germany and he's beside uh, Dachau thinking about the adjacent walls and how in fact genocide is something that's possible in any culture. And I think that the reason this works, the reason this is not preachy is because of the way he uses dialogue in the first section, that because he allows the woman to speak for herself instead of summarizing or giving us exposition about what she says, that we're more able to trust this, this interaction. I also think the fact that he begins by making himself a little bit ridiculous with the, yeah, I said, I studied German for two years in high school and one semester in college paragraph so that we see him too sort of interacting in an almost embarrassing, very American, here are my high school language lessons uh, kind of way with this woman. And I think that it is also this complexity, which is really amazing in such a short piece that allows us to follow him on the narrative arc and sort of earns that final wrap up uh, paragraph that we get at the end about how this could happen anywhere which is something that essays often can't do, particularly essays in miniature. It's very difficult to pull off the move of telling the reader what you want them to get out of the essay. And in most of the other pieces that we read, we'll see that that meaning making is left up to the reader, which is I think more usual, particularly in the miniature. The next one I think we should look at is, you are the tower and I am Rapunzel, she says. The first thing to notice about this, and we'll see this again when we get to Diane Seuss's essay, is the way in which the title functions as also the first line of the piece. We don't see this a lot when we're looking at essays that are, that are full length, but again, this is something that we see pretty often in the miniature where the title either serves as the first line or as the key to understanding the lyric content that follows. I would say this is something we see most often in lyric rather than narrative essays. So we have, you're the tower and I am Rapunzel, she says, and I let her climb my back feet and knees knocking hard on the backs of my thighs, my kidneys, my neck, before she settles herself on my shoulders and calls for her prince to come and rescue her and on and on. I want us also to notice the way in which he's using these very long sentences again, something we're also going to see in the Seuss, and prosody. So very often when we're looking at the short lyric essay, prosody is functioning in the same way that it does in a prose poem. And in fact, the truth is, I think that fairly often the difference between a brief lyric essay and a prose poem is where it's published. I expect that Christopher Lowe and Diane Seuss both also submitted these pieces or, or would have submitted them if they had not been published in brevity to poetry journals. And I, I want us to be aware when we're looking at all of the pieces of how prosody is functioning and in what bar, what creative nonfiction writers borrow from the poets. So here we also have dialogue. And I think it's important too to notice the way in which that bisects the essay that we get the daughter's voice, the my hair is a rope and you can climb it, for, uh, climb it to free me from this tower. I hate this tower. Oh, won't you take me away from here? Uh, stylized version of the daughter's voice exactly in the center of the essay. 
And so it gives this essay a sort of fulcrum. Finally, this is one of the essays where I think that, as we can see, meaning making is left to the reader. We're getting a very lovely and lyrical uh, narrative arc, and we're sort of getting this vignette into the author's life. But what we are to make of it is left to us. What we are to understand that Christopher Lowe is saying about fatherhood is really ours to parse out. And again, I think that's a more common strategy in the brief essay. So now I wanna look at The Heart as a Torn Muscle by Randon no Billings Noble. This is a hermit crab essay. And a hermit crab essay is one that borrows its form from some other form. Here, she's borrowed the form of a, a website that lists uh, medical issues, sort of a WebMD form. Other forms that you'll find, there's Jill Talbot's very estimable, estimable, I, I have a hard time speaking on snow days apparently. It's that not getting coffee at the library thing. Uh, so anyway, uh, Jill Talbot's very estimable uh, essay, The Professor of Longing, that is also written in the form of a syllabus. And she also has another one whose name is escaping me right at this moment that is written in the name of, that's written in the form of a wine list. That's a really excellent example of a hermit crab essay. I have read a, a long full length essay that hasn't been published yet by a woman who's writing environmental nonfiction that takes the form of a lawsuit. And that's been a really interesting form to explore pretty much anything uh, that is a tech genre can be deployed in a hermit crab essay. I also want us to look here at the way that she's using second person. I think that this was really in vogue um, a couple of years ago, and we were seeing a lot of essays in the brevity submission pile that happened in second person. And it can be a tricky thing to pull out, pull off. Here, I think it's working in part because it fits with the genre that she has borrowed to form the essay, that in describing symptoms, websites like WebMD often use the second person. It's a tricky thing to do if you are saying, here is an action that you have done. It's if you're trying to place the, re the reader in the place of the author by using the second person. It's also a little tricky if you're doing it as direct address to the reader, although certainly there are some very good essays that do that. But when you are speaking directly to the reader as a you, you're sometimes overriding the reader's ability to react and saying, here is how you respond to this. And it's important to be careful about that because although direct address works, that particular way of using direct address rarely does. The most common and most effective way that people use direct address is when the you is a character off the page. And so we have the sense that we are eavesdropping on a really intimate conversation where the writer is addressing an other other, not the reader, but a third person and speaking to that person as the you. <clears throat> I also want to note the way that um, that Billing, that Noble here is using the form to break up the way in which she's constructing the narrative. So in symptoms, we pretty much don't have anything all at all about why the heart is a torn muscle in this piece. That doesn't happen until we get into a different section of the essay. Also though, the overview gives us some clues oh yes, that's him, that one. Not the one, the one you already have and deeply love, but of all people in that large room far from home, he was the one for you. And your heart stretched more than it should have, tore a little and let him in. So here we know that she's talking about an emotional infidelity that, that might be too strong. Uh, I think she might use that word, but if she were talking about it, because she's been pretty honest in discussing this essay as being about what it's like to be a married person who, who falls for another person and has to, has to find a way to stop that. Um, and in some ways, this form is particularly well suited to dealing with that kind of material, material that you want to keep 
a little bit private. You want to talk about the experience, but you don't want to talk about the details. And the Hermit Crab essay is really allowing Noble to do that here. I also want us to look at the essay determines how it will begin for prosody issues. So the last essay was a Hermit Crab essay. Here we have uh, an essay that's an anaphora where every paragraph begins with this essay or the essay, sorry. The essay is a transgression. The essay reveals. The essay is a dilemma. The essay is unremarkable. The essay is a discovery. And I think it's important to notice the way that anaphora functions and ties everything together, gives us this sort of incantatory sense of the essay, and also allows for, for fragmentation without a loss of meaning. So here we understand that this is a way of layering multiple meanings on what the essay is. And it allows things to fit together that otherwise we might have a hard time parsing. Like the essay is a transgression. The night you move back in with your ex-husband, you dream you are in bed with your mother. The essay is a little bit of, a, of wobble in the system. Mother says you have wasted thousands on therapy, says she would have given you all the advice you needed for free. Ordering becomes really important in this sort of essay, but in a different way than it does when you have a, a strong narrative arc. And here you can tell that, that Roberts is ordering the essay both for revealing pieces of information uh, in a particularly paced way, but also because she is trying to break up the rhythm. And I think the prose rhythm in this essay is really lovely and it's important to note it. So I'm going to suggest that you read it aloud to yourself and notice the way in this the way in which this would function as a spoken word piece. When you were dealing with pieces that are really clearly very reliant on prosody, I think that very often we should assume that they are at least open to the possibility of performance. And this would be a piece that I think is strongly uh, strongly suggesting an oral piece. Finally, I want to look at Diane Seuss's, I hoisted them to drug dealers. I guess that's what they were. Crackheads, I exiled them is what I did from my son's basement apartment. I'm, I'm a giant Diane Seuss nerd. Uh, I love her work. And this is one of my favorite of her essays. And here again, we have a lot of, of prosody techniques that we would borrow from the prose poem. And, and this probably is both a brief essay and a prose poem. I think sometimes things exist as both, and I don't think there's any escaping the poetics of this. We have the long sentences. We have the fabulous digressions. Uh, I think digression is one of the techniques she is using here, buried inside these long sentences, where we go from the pit bull Svetlana all the way to the hard labor and, and the surgery, and then not being knocked out for the cesarean section, all in one sentence. And I think that this is really a complex piece, but a piece whose shape is very interesting to track. So we go sort of in the moment, and then we narrow all the way down to the birth of the sun. And then we come back out into the moment, then we move finally forward in time, the first time the essay moves forward in time to later that evening. And then we sort of end with, with this large universal, um, with this, here is how I am now. And it's the first time the essay, I think, really becomes about the essayist, as opposed to about the narrative of what happened. And I think that here, like the Alexi, we do have a little bit of the meaning making work being done for the reader by the closing, but it's so abstract and so poetic here that because the reader still has to puzzle out what does the author mean by, um, so don't ask for my touch is what I'm saying. Don't ask me to now walk among the people. That the essay bears multiple readings very well I think I probably had to read this essay maybe 15 times before I really felt like I had done what what Seuss was doing here justice as a reader. 
And I think one of the things that the miniature can do really well that the longer essay just can't is this sort of complex presentation to the reader. That if this were a 15 page essay and it left so much of the work of meaning making up to me, I would probably not be able to hang with an author, even an author as brilliant as Seuss, for 15 pages of this sort of in and out and, and moving into places where I have to figure out the transitions and I have to figure out where we are both in time and in the text. And the miniature can really allow for this sort of abstraction. And I think it's one of its strengths. And so for those of you who are particularly interested in working with abstractions or impressionism in the essay. I think it's a particularly useful form. Well, I, I don't think that was anywhere near as useful as a class discussion would be. And there are lots of ums and ohs because I don't very often have to record my conversations with you. But hopefully this will let us stay on track. I will also be posting to Blackboard a discussion board where you will each upload just a, a brief statement, say one page, looking at the craft issues in the brevity essay that you decided to look at. And then I'm going to ask you each to go and, and interact at least once with everybody else's posts. And all of that information is in an email to you. Don't forget that we've also switched the syllabus so that the very first uh, reading of Safekeeping by Abigail Thomas will be next week. And that's all of section one or I think it's part one, and that we will, instead of next week reviewing our brevity essays and workshopping them, we will do that in the following week, just so that we have some chance to sit down and have a conversation about how the miniature is functioning, not mediated through UTC Learn. All right, I think I'm doing Upspeak and Vocal Fry and everything this morning. I, I really don't like the recording thing, so I'm going to stop and I will see you guys next week.